The Lady of Elche, a limestone bust that was first discovered in 1897. It was found at an archaeological site on a private estate, two kilometers south of Elche within Spain. Currently exhibited at the National Archaeological Museum in Madrid, the artistic influences involved in creating her are a heavily debated topic. This undoubtedly due to her unusual appearance and the fact that no one seems to be able to pinpoint her origins. According to the Encyclopedia of Religion, the Lady of Elche is believed to have a direct association with Tanit, the goddess of Carthage, who was once worshipped by the Punic Iberians. Though at best, this could be perceived as a guess, based on vague similarity. Clearly, the most striking and intriguing detail surrounding the Lady of Elche is her mysterious and possibly advanced technological appendages. Positioned around her head and flowing down the bust, the original function for these strange decorations is unknown. The current academically accepted view is that the originally polychromed bust is thought to have represented a woman wearing a complex headdress, while well, some scholars suggest that the sculpture is Iberian and associated with Tanit, the goddess of Carthage, others have proposed the work reflects a long-lost Atlantean goddess. The unusual features of the sculpture, such as the quietly kept detail that she had an elongated head, has led many independent researchers to suspect the spools were not part of a unique headdress, but was a type of lost technology reflecting the highly advanced nature of the lost and forgotten Atlantean civilization. Art historian John F. Moffat, along with most of academia, agree that the shape of the lady's eyes, nose, and other features were too delicate to have been carved in pre-Christian Spain. Therefore, predictably, instead of suspecting that an unknown, highly advanced civilization could have possibly created it, Many academics have simply concluded it to be an elaborate hoax, regardless of the compelling evidence upon the statue which displays its true antiquity. And also of the fact that in 1997, the mayor of Elche fought to have the bust of the Lady of Elche returned from the National Archaeological Museum of Spain in Madrid to the city of Elche, to be on display during celebrations of the city's 2000th year. It was to be a special exhibit but the petition to have the bust returned was denied. The director of Elche's archaeological museum, Rafael Ramos, argued that it was preposterous to say that the statue could not survive the journey, noting that more delicate pieces are transported around the world regularly. Do these sound like the actions of a group of people who suspect the artifact to be a fake? Or does it sound more like the actions of a group of conspiring individuals with an aim of retaining a valuable, yet largely unknown relic. Is the statue of the Lady of Elche a long-lost Atlantean bust, or maybe a leader of a group of beings whom once visited Earth? Questions surrounding the Lady of Elche largely remain unanswered. How did she end up in a farmer's field in Spain? The disputes and specialist theories surrounding the Lady of Elche clearly illustrate the secret importance of the bust. Just who was the Lady of Elche? An ancient queen? Perhaps an ancient alien? When a piece is clearly treasured by the same group who contest it as a fake, we always find such objects highly compelling. We previously covered what is undoubtedly one of the most peculiar ancient statues ever unearthed. Now known as the Lady of Elche, she mysteriously turned up in 1897, on a private estate two kilometers south of Elche, Spain. Her unusual headdress is obviously her most baffling characteristic, and a subject of heated debate to this day. Some claim that it is nothing but a mere fashion item, although their links to other ancient examples are reaching at best. Other theories pertain to them depicting some form of ancient advanced headphones an antenna, or even that she was actually an ancient alien. An additional enigma surrounding the Lady of Elche is the cavity within her back, empty when discovered. The question is, why was the statue made in such a way? What was once placed within the statue? The information known about her is understandably extremely limited. 
She was long thought to be one of a kind, and as such, easily dismissed by academics as a mere one-off. However, it seems the lady wasn't actually unique. Additionally, she may have actually been a rather well-known figure to a civilization we are possibly yet to understand. Although the statue was found in Spain in 1969, in Richfield, Utah, another as yet unexplained object was found. Discovered at a depth of 6 feet, within soil that contained no other evidence of past disturbance, what some now think was once a buckle adorned with what clearly was an image of the Lady of Elche. The question is, who was the Lady of Elche? Why is an ancient medallion, presumed belt buckle, found within an empty field in Utah adorned with her image? Furthermore, upon the observance of the buckle, along with the bust of the Lady of Elche, is perhaps the most compelling clue pertaining to her identity discovered yet. Many people suggested that, due to the Lady of Elche's unusual existence and the claimed location of the discovery of the buckle, it was claimed that the Utah Lady was in fact a fake. However, after extensive research, the inscription upon the obverse was found to actually be authentic ancient Assyrian, translated as the Assyrian. Was this the original name for the Lady of Elche? Who were these particular-looking Assyrians? Was she a member of the civilization modern academia have permitted such extensive study of? If so, why are we not aware of such a clearly famous yet visually unique character? Were the Assyrians actually another lost, advanced, ancient civilization? Perhaps the inspiration for the name of the Assyrian culture we are so aware of? Are the real Assyrians being obscured by a claimed more recent imposter by academia? Or were they merely a weird fashion item? For now, her identity is still up for debate. However, such finds undoubtedly strengthen some highly compelling possibilities. Who built the Boro Bodor? One of the largest yet most infrequently academically shared Buddhist monuments in the world. Supposedly built within the 8th century AD, it ranks as one of the greatest archaeological sites of Asia, if not the world. We have on many occasions covered seemingly unexplainable, enormous ancient monuments and ruins that we feel are attributed to a more modern inhabitant who, according to the same academic study, were undoubtedly severely lacking the capability to complete such builds. In other words, we believe that due to the inexplicable nature of their construction, and indeed often the scale of the stonework involved in these sites, they were instead seen as an advantageous place to re-inhabit. In doing so, these piggyback cultures created their own illusions of power. Obviously, claiming they built such awe-inspiring, intimidating structures would have immediately put any native adversary or any invading party on the back foot. A daunting task for any of our ancestors, merely armed with swords and catapults to have invaded. Sites such as the Great Pyramids, Sacsayhuaman, Kulap, or any other incredibly well-constructed ancient fortress or structure would have provided a superior level of security, a ready-built sanctuary, allowing their people to flourish and, in turn, giving our modern academia a culprit to pin the constructions to. Additionally, the religious idols, the artistically illustrated belief systems, and any leftover technologies would have been adopted by these people. Thus, we strongly suspect that religions such as Buddhism was in fact left to us by a highly advanced lost civilization translated and embraced by our more modern ancestors. This adaptation of belief systems has conveniently allowed the furthering of the agenda of academia, yet the structure's inexplicable features are merely ignored by this group, rather than ever explained, this due to them simply incapable of explaining such constructions. This long list of worldwide unexplained anomalies, which grows in depth every day, is one of the main reasons why most of our taught history, we feel, is now obviously a lie. 
In truth, no one actually knows who built Baro Bador. They do not know when Baro Bador was built. And most important of all, they have no clue how it was built. The unexplained features within Baro Bador are greater in number than almost any other ancient site on Earth. And we suspect this to be the reason why it is rarely shared publicly. Yet, its past importance has not been overlooked by the modern world. Baro Bador, since knowledge of his existence was sparked in 1814 by Sir Thomas Ramford Raffles, then the British ruler of Java, who was informed of his existence and location by native Indonesians. Furthermore, speculation about an ancient lake which once surrounded Baro Bador was the subject of intense debate during the 20th century. In 1931, a Dutch artist and scholar of Hindu and Buddhist architecture, W.O.J. Nieuwenkamp, developed a hypothesis that the Kedu Plain, which surrounds the pyramidal structure, was once a lake, with Borobador created to appear as a lotus flower floating on the water. We strongly believe that Borobador, along with its curious architecture, is one of the most enigmatic, as yet unexplained, ancient site on Earth and as such, highly compelling. The modern-day institution, man's way of organizing belief systems into their different clans, cult-like attitudes, often driven by an existential perception, specialisms of some form or merely a naturally occurring passion. They are either built around a certain series of events or an apparent fact or claim, which stand as the cornerstones of said institution. It is therefore within the profiteers of said ideology's interests to not only suppress any evidence that may surface that would make their treasured institutions crumble to their very core foundation, but to actively destroy said relics whenever one gets an opportunity to do so. The Bamian Buddha, for example, apparently this monstrous carving, perfectly bored into a sheer rock face in the Bamian Valley of central Afghanistan, is not only a relic which we hypothesize was left by a now lost civilization, but due to the facial features once masterfully depicted upon the statue, removed at some later time within history, carved flat, not only making its identification as Buddha questionable, it was for some reason completely destroyed during the Iraq War. Its destruction, I propose, supports our prior posit of it indeed being that of a lost civilization's work this being the sole motive for such actions. Interestingly, hidden voids found behind the carving. If it were indeed a solid carving, as one would have once presumed when gazing upon it, how were these hollow chambers once placed behind said carving? Additionally, not only do most modern institutions deny any of the evidence we so often put forward on our channel, often in regards to a past law civilization, but fields such as geology is simply actively writing off countless ancient sites and anomalies as simply geological coincidences, their existence being an impossibility according to already established, supposedly concluded chronology for human civilization. One reoccurring strategy, which I like to call the pareidolia effect denial, has befallen countless sites of interest. One of the most hotly debated being the face on Mars, now simply dismissed as a trick of light, the intriguing pyramidal features nearby, which also somehow align with Pleiades. This denial strategy has condemned other said features here on Earth, some of which found in remote places that, according to modern academia, have simply never been inhabited. Thus, regardless of the artificial nature of such places as Gornia Shoria, must be dismissed as mere coincidental geological features. The ruins clearly immense age, often used, in an unfortunate twist of fate, as support of such claims, as nature eventually reclaims all, thus the older the ruin, the easier this said denial strategy is to argue. That is, until now, in a modern era, where modern technology now allows us to collect a massive amount of information on simply anything unexplained features, parts, and many other advanced unexplained legacies of an antiquity, once hidden, now shared far and wide. 
evidence which flies in the face of modern paradigm. This Charonian is yet another of these curious, clearly immensely old anomalies that regardless of its form, once being carved from extremely tough rock, maybe this is why our lost ancestors built with such enormous stones, and did so in an as yet unexplained, yet clearly highly advanced way, known as polygonal masonry. Perhaps they built like this so that their footprint here on our planet be long-lived, designed to deliberately be resistant to the elements, to reach us now in the modern day, giving all of us an opportunity to understand the real history of our Earth, regardless of what others would like. We find all of these things highly compelling.